I can't even believe probably how much time I spent listening to and trying to understand Japanese. The only time I wasn't immersing would be when I was eating dinner with my family. <laughs> <laughs> I had no shame and I was not about to pretend that I wasn't going to succeed at everything that I wanted to do. <laughs> I remember my host hand being like, mm-hmm, I'm sure you are. But look at me now, host family. In this video, I interview Nicholas Edwards, an American who's currently a professional singer in Japan. Nick has probably the most impressive Japanese I've ever heard from a Westerner before, and in this video, I ask him in detail exactly how he got to his current level in Japanese. Now, before I jump into the video, I wanna ask you guys for some advice. You see, I'm trying to find out what type of content you want me to make for you in these next coming weeks. Now, it's only gonna take less than five minutes, and I'm gonna be reading each and every response personally, so please click that first link in the description to give me some advice about what type of content you wanna see. Thanks so much, and with that out of the way, let's jump into the interview. Hey, Nick, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you, you for having me. I am doing great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing really great. I'm really excited to talk to you because you're probably the most impressive foreign language Japanese speaker that I've seen on YouTube. Oh, thank you. I had to, don't know that I deserve that title, but I appreciate it. Yeah, there with the Japanese modesty. But anyway, well, I want to jump into exactly how you got to the point you're at today. So when did you first decide that you were interested in learning Japanese? Did you have any kind of connection to Japan when you were first growing up or anything? Um, honestly, the only... My first memory of hearing a Japanese word was some old episode of Kim Possible where there's like some factory where they kept saying Konnichiwa, Konnichiwa. 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 And I... Like, I, I really didn't have any particular connection to Japanese other than the high school that I went to um, back home had a Japanese program. And the mm -hmm. reason that I chose Japanese was, well, the reason that I had an interest in Japanese is because it was the only language that wasn't a European language. And that just seemed like, mm -hmm. I guess, a challenge and also just like it would be uh, like a fresh perspective linguistically, mm -hmm. not that I was any kind of language connoisseur at the time. But, um, and so I, I was thinking that I wanted to study Japanese. And so I talked to my homeroom teacher in middle school where I had just, just awful grades. And my teacher was like, I don't understand why you would choose the hardest language when you don't study anything. And I was not, I didn't like that. So that, so that kind of like, I guess, kick me in the butt to decide to study the harder one. I, we had mm -hmm. German, Spanish, French, and Japanese at my high school. So I was like, Japanese it is. And that was really this. So there was no particular like, all right, I really want to learn Japanese or mm -hmm. I had like this specific interest in Japan. I just, when I was approached with the necessity of having to learn a language, yeah. it just seemed like the most interesting one. That's cool. And I feel like we should address right here that actually we grew up in a place really close to one another. And I've heard of the high school you went to and you've heard of the high school I went to. So that's just a crazy coincidence. That is really crazy. Uh, who knows? Maybe we passed each other on the street sometime. Like <laughs> Potentially. 15 years ago or something. It's funny because there's not like a ton of people from, you know, the, I guess, Portland area. I mean, there are obviously yeah. people there, but I haven't ran into many. So it was very, it was a big coincidence. Yeah, that was really uh, cool to, to hear. Well, actually, the person who put us in touch is, is Yoko-san. And she was saying, hey, maybe people from the, this part of Portland have some, some special ability. to <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, yeah. So first time you started studying Jap uh, Japanese was when you entered high school. So then how, how did it take off from there? Um, well, I had an interest in music since I was little or I guess young. Um, since I remember. And I remember I started studying Japanese and probably for the first like six months or so, it was really just my elective course. And um, I did have, I was more interested in it than like algebra, which, <laughs> but I was always more interested in even, j even just English and like language arts. Mm. So I always liked language even in just the sense of my own native language. So I, I liked Japanese right from the start because it was just the kind of study that I liked. But um, mm -hmm. I really started working hard at it, I guess, when I started listening to Japanese music. So I think that was kind of like, um, it combined the interest or I guess passion that I already had for music with kind of like the newfound um, mm -hmm. interest in Japanese. And they kind of like bounced off each other because I... I, at the time, I really just liked music 
as a hobby, but learning Japanese and enjoying Japanese music kind of they they both became more interesting mm -hmm. to me in that in in and, coming together. And what artists did you like at the time? Um, I, the first artist that I listened to was um, <laughs> sorry, I just uh, so I, was, I have the really bad habit of I want to say um, but I keep speaking Japanese because. That's what, oh, no, that's what I speak every day. Uh, Kobukuro, the like, there's it's like a two guy duo from the Osaka region, and um, I listened to one of their songs called Subomi, and uh, it was really interesting to me because um, I don't know how much Japanese music you listen to, but they, it, well, not they. I, <laughs> I hate it when people say that, but Japanese music has like a a really a really big focus on the lyrics and like the mm -hmm. and the listener's ability to understand like what's being said for through the entire song and to me so as someone who grew up on you know english language music we tend to like i mean if you turn off the radio in the car everybody's singing a different <laughs> lyric it's like <laughs> we know the key words because we know like what the song is about but when you get to like the the specifics and the detailed parts it's kind of you can't even native speakers can't necessarily understand everything yeah right really off true. the bat but japanese language has a really big focus on being able to kind of follow the story the whole way through it has a lot mm. to do with kind of just the nature of japanese pronunciation but that was really interesting to me because even though i had only been studying japanese for so many months i could hear and kind of like pick out all the all the sounds which i wouldn't have thought i would be able to do because of just how I'm sure yeah, the opposite yeah. is not true. I don't think that people who just kind of yeah. started learning English can, even if, if we can't even pick out all the sounds. So uh, that was definitely um, a big motivator for me was that interest in music combined with my new interest in Japanese. Yeah. That's really interesting. I've never heard someone made that point, but as soon as you point that out, it's so true. It's a lot easier to understand the lyrics and Japanese people definitely seem to appreciate lyrics on average more than most people I know uh, around here that's really interesting so then yeah wh where did things go from there with your studies um so I ended up <laughs> I always feel weird talking about this because I'm like I'm so smart and such a quick learner but I <laughs> I, um, I did all four years of high school Japanese in a year well in three semesters so mm -hmm. I did my freshman year and my sophomore year of Japanese in my freshman year. And then in the first semester of my um, sophomore year, I did my junior year and my senior year. Um, and the reason is just because once you get to junior and senior year, it's kind of just like memorizing a bunch of stuff. So it was easier mm -hmm. to like speed through that. But um, so I ended up doing all four years that were available in high school in my first three semesters of high school. And were there other people who were doing this or were you just like on your own? You like talked to the teacher and you went off and learned it yourself. I was just of course, I was getting help from my teacher, but I was just moving ahead without the class because I knew that that was um, kind of the path that I wanted. I was already even in those first six months that I wasn't. I mean, maybe not six months, my, the first semester when I wasn't like, um, I wasn't sitting all day studying Japanese, but mm -hmm. I, I think I, because it was interesting to me, I was always ahead of like the general mm -hmm. class just because I think I was studying more than everybody else who was just kind of like, maybe took Japanese because it technically has a lower fluency requirement to get the <laughs> credit. <laughs> so um, I was always, even in the beginning when I wasn't like going full out, um, a little bit ahead of the rest yeah, of the class. Yeah. But I knew as soon as I started really studying the music and um, kind of, you know, when I started listening to the music, it became this like just a need to like understand. So I ended up mm -hmm. moving ahead and I just talked to my teacher and said that I wanted to do that. And I mean, I guess probably because I was the only one doing that. She was like, well, that's oh, OK. I already have the packets. So <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> the packets. Yeah. Cool. And so then after you completed the first four years worth of curriculum, then what did you do? That was the first. So I went to Japan for the summer. Um, 
you may know this, but Hillsborough, where I grew up in, well, not exactly true, but where I went to high school in Oregon is uh, a city called Hillsborough, and it's sister cities with um, a city in Shizuoka called Fukuroi. Mm -hmm. And that city kind of had a, um, not kind of, I don't know why I'm like qualifying everything. <laughs> I'm too used to speaking Japanese and pretending I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, my so that city is a sister is sister cities with Fukuroi, and they have a a kind of like homestay exchange program. Mm -hmm. And during my freshman year, for like a week or two, a couple students from Fukuroi had stayed at my house, and so. I didn't do like the official study ab or not study abroad, but um, homestay program. Mm -hmm. But I just had stayed in contact with the um, students who came to my place, so I just went and visited them. Oh, cool! Over the summer, mm -hmm. and um, at, at that point, because when I had when I went to Japan for the first time, I was already not really struggling. To communicate in the sense that if I didn't understand some things, I could just have somebody explain it to me in Japanese and figure it out from the Japanese that I did know. So mm -hmm. I was at that point. I wasn't really since I came, went to Japan and everything that I had been like working hard for, I guess, um, mm -hmm. felt like it was working or it was happening. I mm -hmm. think I was very, especially being fifteen at the time. I was like, this is my life now so <laughs> i went back and finished high school and how long was that exchange you said just like a just weeks. like a, a, a my exchange to japan was like almost three months i think oh wow so like for the whole summer yeah it was from june to like i guess the end of august so um and i spent half the time in tokyo with um a different uh friend that I had made through studying Japanese in Oregon, and then I spent half the time in Shizuoka. So it was like a kind of like half and half in the city and in mm -hmm. the I don't want to say country, but oh. in the not yeah. in the not city. <laughs> and um, I spent about like a little less than three months, I think. Um, and then very cool, very begrudgingly went home to finish my <laughs> high school <laughs> so you felt pretty at home at japan right off the bat yeah definitely i mean i don't really know that i necessarily felt home in the sense that like everything was felt like a perfect fit so much as i think i was just really excited by being in an environment where i didn't um like i felt to a degree uncomfortable and i mean maybe uncomfortable is not the correct word but like I felt unfamiliar. Yeah, unfamiliar, and then felt kind of like excited by that, mm -hmm. like lack of familiarity, and so I felt. I guess it was just interesting, <laughs> in a really, really simple yeah. way. Um, and so I think that I I liked being in an environment where I felt like I was being able to absorb information and kind of like build my own, for lack of a better phrase like build my own life I guess not mm -hmm. so much just what I had already been given I guess in Oregon so mm. I was just it felt immediately like what I knew I, I wanted I knew I wanted to come back when I was done with high school cool so yeah that totally makes sense I know for me too going to Japan the first time brought it to life in a way that uh, it really hadn't, hadn't been before so then Coming back, how did you continue to study Japanese now that you, you finished the whole curriculum at school? Um, I definitely, of course, continued to get help from my Japanese teacher. Um, for the most part, for, I mean, I... It's... I don't know if this is true for everybody, but I barely remember high school. And the only reason that I remember all of these things is because I've, like, I've had this conversation like consistently since uh -huh. I came to Japan so it's all like ingrained into me but I don't even remember like exactly what I did specifically to study but I I know that I like bought I guess textbooks online and stuff that were uh aimed for like university level Japanese uh -huh. learners um and I continued like the specific thing that I probably did that maybe was a little bit off the beaten path was a lot of lyric translation and um a lot of like I guess, immersion with entertainment. 
So mm-hmm. I think that was the the big. For the first two years, I really learned all of the basic workings of Japanese, and all of the vocab you need to kind of like build a foundation. And then the mm-hmm. second two years of high school, I think I was definitely um, kind of honing that into a more like day to day usable craft <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i, I don't want to guide you too much because anyone who watches my channel knows i'm a really big proponent of using media to immerse yourself and and learn that way through focusing on building up your comprehension but you, you, did you do a lot of that uh i thought you'd like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i definitely because i was already I, i'm somebody who even even in my native language or in any language really i've just always been interested in art so it was easy for me to just sit there and watch like a drama even if i didn't understand everything it was easy for me to just be like oh what a fascinating i mean i could go on and on about all the differences between the way that american people film things and the way that japanese people film things or you know the the way that japanese people write and the way that american people write um but you know those kind of like noticing those differences was really interesting to me so on top of yeah. that, because I was interested in just the art itself, it was really easy for me to just sit there and just take a ton in. So, I mean, immersion is definitely, I mean, it seems like, I guess, I didn't even really think of it as immersion at the time. I was just enjoyed it. So I just did it. Yeah. But now that I look okay. back on it, it was definitely like, I think that I can't even believe probably how much time I spent, like, I guess, hearing, listening to, and trying to understand Japanese, being that I was in a country where, I mean, the only person I knew who spoke Japanese was my Japanese teacher, who I wasn't going to sit there and, like, (laughs) talk to the phone, talk on the phone with, like, all night. So (laughs) it was definitely, um, I really went for it, (laughs) whether I meant to or not. That's awesome. So what, you mentioned dramas, what other types of Japanese media were you spending a lot of time with? I definitely, well, because I love music, a big one was, um, the, there's a lot of, I don't even know exactly what you would call them in, in English, but I mean, we used to have a, more in the eighties, but just basically like hit song shows where artists who were on the charts would come and just sing in order, mm-hmm. like just like 10 different groups or people in like an hour. Um, so like just the music section of Jimmy Fallon the whole time. <laughs> or like just yeah, the music yeah. section of like Saturday Night Live the entire time. And um but there was also interviews in those sections. So mm-hmm. I would listen to like artists who I had who I was interested in or who I like admired. I would listen to their interviews. Um and definitely a lot of music. Um of course, you know, movies and dramas are always good because they you get to hear a lot of situational japanese whereas if you're just Mm -hmm. watching if you're just watching interviews those are kind of going to always be the same it's going to always be the same Mm -hmm. thing which is like you know what is this song about like (laughs) where are you from yeah (laughs) and stuff like that um but i think definitely dramas and also i would say another big one that's important is if you can like get to a point where you can be entertained by it definitely japanese like comedy mm-hmm. is a good one too because yeah. that's important for communicating with japanese people yeah definitely and what about reading and were you studying kanji a lot as well or mostly f- focusing on the spoken language i would say that i i'm well i guess not really now because i am always on my phone but at the time i could definitely write anything that i could say so i always had a big or like I guess a a decent focus on written language because it's one of the main things when you're studying in a foreign not a foreign foreign country when you're studying in a country that's not Japan Mm -hmm. um I mean you can't just sit there and listen to interviews the whole time so obviously I spent a lot of that time you know learning kanji and I mean, as of right now, I do, like, radio programs and stuff where I just read scripts. So the reading, mm-hmm. being able to read is a big one in Japan. And yeah, Japanese people definitely. definitely will appreciate if you can read. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I definitely spent a lot of time studying kanji. I don't know that I read a lot, a ton of books. Um, I 
I mean, I know that this is not like the academic thing to say, but I'm not a, a really a book reader. <laughs> 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 I mean, like I appreciate a good book and I always read like the, the like common ones, I guess, like mm -hmm. Harry Potter or whatever. Um, but when I came to Japan, I only really read books when either they were so popular that it was just, I mean, if I didn't read them, I was going to be out of the loop. Or yeah. I read them just for, like, Natsume Soseki is, like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, like, the famous, well, not famous, because he's obviously not famous alive anymore, fan. but, you yeah. know, like, very well-known um, author from many years ago. And I read mm -hmm. a few of his books because, well, just because they're culturally re relevant, and yeah. also because, uh, to be honest, not really culturally relevant to anybody my age <laughs> but, <laughs> but culturally relevant in the sense that like there's a lot of older people in Japan who really really like it when you read books <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> nah, just to be honest it was mostly like a learning thing just to study a little bit but I wasn't a huge reader yeah well that's interesting because from what I've seen people who aren't as big of readers and they they're mostly focused on the spoken language tend to have really impressive pronunciation compared to people who mostly spend their time reading and i think it kind of makes sense because so much of pronunciation is being being able to mimic what you're hearing and that implies having really refined listening abilities whereas if you get really reading dominant then i think your brain can kind of basically learn to understand what you're hearing in spite of maybe not picking up on the smallest nu nuances of the sound because you have so much contextual understanding of, of what what words are likely to be used with what other words but Anyway, sorry to rail so much on, on this period, but I feel like this is, in a sense, pot potentially the, the time of your Japanese life where you really, you know, came out of the cocoon, we could say. So uh, how many hours a day would you guess, on average, you were spending contacting Japanese media in some way? I mean, an, uh, an unreal amount, like, to be honest. And I don't mean that to say, like, I studied so hard because it really genuinely was not, like, it, again, it was not like sitting down and studying algebra for me at all. I just mm -hmm. did it because that was like my hobby even more than it was like a, a field of study for me. But I mean, anywhere from like, I mean, when I came home, the only time I wasn't probably like, I guess, immersing would be when I was eating dinner with my family. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say probably at least like four hours a day. But um. Mm -hmm probably generally more like five or six because I'm a bit of a night owl. <laughs> oh, cool. yeah, I mean... Now it's making sense. How'd you get so good? Here are the secrets. Spend a ton of time with Japanese for fun. I think that, like, that formative time is probably really important because mm -hmm. living in Japan, you see a lot of people kind of, like, hit a... I mean, not necessarily, like, a roadblock, but, like, enough, like feeling like it's enough. And I think that because there was, I took in so much information, A, when my brain was so soft and young, <laughs> but also, like, B, when it was the very beginning of my learning Japanese, so I had, like, a very, um, it, it was all kind of, like, input, input, input. Mm -hmm. So it was just ended up being, like, a, a great great cocktail that I didn't even realize was happening yeah. at the time. It's kind of funny because like I was probably a little more conscious of my learning process yet overall I was doing almost the exact same thing you were doing you know just input all the time spending as much time as possible with uh with Japanese and so for learning new words and stuff like that were you kind of just looking them up as you came across them and you had so much exposure you could just increase your vocabulary pretty naturally? That I mean I definitely did spend a lot of time going through, you know, with like learning materials and learning kind of words in the order that they were, I guess, basically like recommended to me f by either my teacher or by like some sort of formal mm -hmm. uh, learning material. But I would say the biggest reason that I was probably able to speak Japanese with Japanese people when I came to Japan for the first time was because I learned a lot of my vocabulary that was not recommended to me from translating Japanese song lyrics. Um, mm. Because, you know, the the really, I guess, good thing, what a terrible adjective, the good thing about <laughs> song lyrics is that they're 
you know, the p things that people decide to write songs about are usually the things that are most, you know, near and dear to them in like their daily life. Mm. So, you know, phrases that involve your feelings and phrases that involve, or just like words or vocabulary that involves, you know, um, your more like inner thoughts as opposed to like, you know, that's a cat or whatever it yeah. might be. Just learning words that are descriptive of how you feel can be really important because I think that's, I mean, that's basically what we're talking about all the time, all day is yeah. how we feel. <laughs> so I think that that, if, if you're focused too much on like, you know, if you go to Japan and you don't know how to say garbage can, somebody can just point at a garbage can and tell you how to say it. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're learn, if you're trying to learn like to describe like how you felt when somebody like cut you off in a line earlier, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of words are not something that you can just point at and be like, this is yeah, like, this is being pissed off <laughs> or like what? <laughs> it's so I think it's a might be a good idea for some people to kind of focus on that more personal like, yeah. lane of vocabulary because that's I mean if you're interested in going to Japan and you know some people learn language because it's kind of it's almost like collecting information whereas I think for me it was mm -hmm. more like I was about you know communicating with or go being in Japan I guess so that was like a big, I guess, focus of my study was I wanted to be able to convey my feelings and I guess express my thoughts without having to kind of like look for the most basic vocab mm -hmm. and then just hope that they realize that I'm deeper than I sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so when you were translating those song lyrics, w would you make flashcards for the words that you wanted to remember? Or did you just do so much of it that you naturally ended up remembering what they all meant? Well, one of the big things was I always translated um, by hand. So I would write the whole song in Japanese and then I would translate it, like write it out and translate it. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but whenever I write something, it always sticks in my mind more. And that's even true when I'm just like making flashcards. So a lot of the times, mm -hmm. especially towards the second and or this the third and fourth years when I was like when I had kind of got the general idea of how Japanese people or how the Japanese language goes about like making words or kind of uh, expressing ideas I would like make flashcards but by the time I had made them all and was like doing I had already memorized them <laughs> from just writing them yeah so I think um I did make flashcards but I don't know that I ended up there's like a ton, I'm sure, somewhere in a closet somewhere back in Oregon that I like made once and then never touched again. I should give those to somebody, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe everyone should just make their own and then they won't need them anymore. That yeah. is definitely true. Cool. And then the last thing I'll ask about this kind of period was what were you thinking of your goal at the time? Was it just kind of an exploratory type of thing where you knew you wanted to pursue it more, but you didn't have a clear goal? Or did, were, did you already know, like, I'm going to go to Japan and I want to have this type of career or something like that? By the time that I finished my kind of like homestay, which was, uh, I guess that was 2008, I think. So by that time, I was like, by, when I was already in Japan, I was like, I'm going to be a singer in Japan to my host family. <laughs> I had no shame, and I was not about to pretend that I wasn't going to succeed at everything that I wanted to do. <laughs> I, <laughs> and I remember my host family being like, mm-hmm, I'm sure you are. <laughs> but look at me now, host family. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's the psychology of uh, successful people, huh? I definitely knew I I was I mean there was no doubt in my mind <laughs> by that time for sure okay cool so you you knew the path that you were on yeah I think I mean even from I knew for myself even like before like I probably studied for a year but I was like I knew to the point that I was like ready to tell everybody in my life by the end of the second year, really. So, I mean, I never intended to like set a specific goal and it wasn't like, I wasn't like manifesting anything. That was just kind of, I mean, I was not, 
I didn't grow up in a big city, so I was, I didn't know that you weren't supposed to just <laughs> tell everybody uh, that, what you were going to do. I mean, everybody in my high school knew. I would do, I like sang Japanese songs in my talent show. I was full, not ashamed in any way. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Especially because it became reality, so... Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And so on the singing end, were you also like practicing? I mean, I don't know that much about singing or music in general. What were you doing on the music end to move towards that career? Um, well, I was just and that. So I would I would translate those Japanese songs. And when I felt like I had a good grasp of what they meant, I would always sing them. And I at the time, see, this is where I'm like, I don't even remember exactly but i'm pretty sure that i was already i was posting singing covers on youtube um probably huh. when i was like 15 maybe i th i think um which have all since been taken down because um although recently that's not the case as much as it used to be 10 years ago japanese people loved a good copyright so, <laughs> so i was um at the time this was like before japan had even like was ready to admit that youtube existed yeah but I imagine. with then when i came to japan and when i started singing and when i got signed with a major record label they were like well you can't just have <laughs> like everybody's songs <laughs> for free on youtube so i had to take those down but i was putting my covers on youtube and i was getting feedback um and that was definitely so it was like a whole it was a whole big big old hobby for me so i just sang a lot i did, i wasn't like taking voice lessons or anything but um those two i mean i said that i guess in the beginning but the the singing i guess or the music and the japanese really really kind of like um I cannot speak English. <laughs> like complimented each other. Yeah, complimented each other and made made each other like much stronger. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and I'm curious on YouTube, did you ever speak Japanese as well? I'm assuming that you had like the titles of the song names in Japanese yeah. as well. Um, I never really had like speaking videos in the sense that I would just like I would sit down and talk. I remember there was a time like right after I came to Japan. I think that maybe I would put up like a, a vlog kind of video mm -hmm. of me visiting Oregon or like my high school or something. Oh God, I don't even want to think about it. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> the singing, the singing is just as embarrassing. So I have Japanese copyright laws to thank for sparing me from having to <laughs> everybody go back and listen to those covers. But um, I was not... I've never been, like, the kind of person who was, I think, well, I mean, that might be saying too much, but I was never, like, a genius at anything. I just, both singing and Japanese, I just really, like, did it a lot. And so it yeah. eventually was not as embarrassing <laughs> as it started out being. But um, it, I can't even, I guess 10 years in Japan and also getting older changes you because I cannot imagine just <laughs> willy-nilly... <laughs> absolutely unabashedly putting myself out there like I did when I was in my late teens. As they say in Japanese, wakage no itari. Yes, that is definitely... I mean, I don't even know if that's enough to cover all the <laughs> all the trauma. <laughs> it was definitely... Uh, that was definitely it. But it definitely seems like it, it all uh, turned out for the best. So, yeah, after graduating high school, so it sounds like you went right to Japan. How did you make that happen? I was so dramatic. I went, I came to Japan the day after I graduated high school and <laughs> I bought that ticket. You better believe I bought that ticket like at the six month deadline, the day that you could buy it six months in advance. <laughs> um, I, and that's another thing that I can't even believe went down the way it did. I came to Japan with a no visa and B, like, really no plan. So I just came to Japan the day after I graduated, and I stayed with the host family that I had stayed with in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And then I just went with no appointment to a bunch of record labels and agencies and was like, my name's Nicholas Edwards, and I'm here to be the next big thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which, that is not quite how it played out, but... Um, 
I, again, I guess just really put myself out there. Um, and I wasn't, I mean, I just thought that if I didn't do it, it wouldn't happen. So I guess I just yeah. did it. <laughs> and so we did one of the record labels uh, show interest. What actually happened? Um, so a couple of record labels did show interest, but the problem with that was that I didn't have a visa. And um, mm. also, I don't know if this is a, a like public, not public knowledge, I'm sure it's public knowledge, but I don't know if this is like a well-known fact, but it is really hard to take or to get um, a v not to get a visa, but it's really hard to get um, like any kind of high level visa when you are not a college graduate. Mm. Um, and that obviously depends on the field you're working in, but specifically for like America to Japan, because there isn't really a lot of emigration from America or immigration from America to Japan based around like, um, like maybe like hard labor or something like that. The visas available tend to be like cultural visas or like teaching visas or things like that. And um, it's really hard to get those without um, mm -hmm. a college or a university degree. So they were like, I, we don't know. I mean, good for you, but we don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so I ended up um, getting an offer to be on a Japanese TV program, which was not like a paid program, but like a singing competition. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't need a visa to be on that. And after, and being on that kind of gave me exposure to a degree where record labels were like, okay, well now we'll get you a visa because you, we have like a guarantee that, I mean, at least we're not gonna be shoveling out a bunch of money we don't need to be. Yeah, you kind of proved yourself. Cool, and so were there multiple offers? How'd you choose which record label to go with? Um, I ended up, so that TV show that I was on, the singing competition, it wasn't like American Idol or something where you're like on it for a season and then mm -hmm. you eat, win or lose. It was more like a, like once every few months, kind of like, I mean, somebody wins and somebody doesn't, or other people don't win, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like you get a record deal just for winning the show. And there yeah, wasn't really yeah. any kind of prize other than just the knowledge that you beat everybody yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um i actually ended up winning the show a few times and nice. because i won i ended up getting offers from a few record deals later on but before that i ended up um joining an i guess you'd call it an agency in mm -hmm. America. In Japanese, it's jimusho, but it doesn't really mean agency in the way that we think of it in America, but it's more of like a, a company that in America, you pay the person, the talent pays an agent to kind of like manage them. Whereas in Japan, mm -hmm. the agency pays the talent for like exclusive rights to their everything related to entertainment. Yeah. So I ended up entering a jimusho or like an an agency, I guess a talent agency. And then through them, I ended up in 2013, I ended up um, doing my first major record with Warner Music Japan. Cool. And so... Man, yeah, so many places we could, could go from there. But that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess... Just to start off focusing on the Japanese side of things, so... When you first arrived in Japan, if now your Japanese power level is 100, what was your power level at? At that point in time. <laughs> um, like, I guess... I know, it's probably I, hard to remember. <laughs> if I think back... Well, I mean, there's plenty of recordings left, but well, the one thing about that show is that you don't, like, speak Japanese on it. So, I mean, not that you're not allowed to speak Japanese, but it's just the setup is more like you have, like, a pre-recorded interview, and then you just sing get your points and then the like the actual show itself is like over so mm -hmm. I don't really I don't remember exactly how well I spoke Japanese but I know that I was speaking Japanese to the degree that I was a not having a problem 
communicating, which I already hadn't been having a problem communicating, I guess, but I was, I guess, communicating the way, well, I was already writing my own song lyrics at that time. So I had definitely sure. gotten to a level where I was able to release music on a major record label and write the lyrics. And, you know, a Japanese record label would be like, these are good lyrics. All right, we're done. So I know that at least by 2013, I was at the very least writing Japanese and composing Japanese sentences and, and like ideas in Japanese uh -huh. to a degree that Japanese people were able to take that at face value and not be like, what? Or feel uh -huh. like it was strange. Um, I think that my pronunciation was probably uh, definitely not as pitch wise uh, uh -huh. correct as it might be today. Actually, I'm doing a stage play at the moment, which has reminded me of how much I struggled with pitch accent when I did a stage play mm. when I was 19. So this is when you first went to Japan? Yeah, so I had and been And what year was that? I moved to Japan in 2010 when I was 17. Okay. And then I did the stage play, I think when I was So 19. you graduated high school pretty early then? Yeah, I the summer baby, so I was just ended up being 17, I guess. I wasn't, like, skipping around, <laughs> but... Oh, okay. Um, I just happened to be 17 when I graduated, and I had all my credits. And then I came to Japan. Um, I f was first on TV when I was 18, so it, I had been in Japan for a little... A, like, almost exactly a year when I ended up on TV. And then after I had won the show, I got offers to do kind of like a... It's actually a book series that became an anime that became a stage play kind of situation. Japanese people mm -hmm. love that. <laughs> yes. So it's kind of like Niten Gojigen, like like a I don't actually know how Tenny Pretty, I don't know what that's called. Like tennis tennis prince. Okay. Prince of tennis, tennis, maybe? Prince of tennis, yeah. Um that's not what the play was, but it was like that where it was like a an anime. It was called Gingai Yudensetsu, which is Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Oh, I, I, yes. <laughs> um, and so I did like the stage play version of that. And that was such a struggle for me because it was already not like normal Japanese in the sense that it was mm -hmm. um, like the, the anime kind of Japanese, which I don't know. Yeah, if that's like because Japanese people don't talk like that. <laughs> yeah. Also, I mean, I've seen that that anime even for an anime, it's very difficult language. A lot of big words that you don't hear very often. Definitely. So, because it's like a space wars, I mean, I probably yeah. couldn't have even done it in English. But um, I remember really struggling. I didn't struggle so much with, like, the individual pitch accent of each word because I was pretty okay with that. Not on purpose, necessarily, but I think probably because I was involved with music. So mm -hmm. I was pretty okay with individual pitch accent, but when I was stringing together like these long words that, especially because there was a lot of um, onyomi, because it's like space wars. So there's a bunch yeah. of words that are just like the, the ch I guess, Chinese reading that yeah. are just like strung together. And after like the fourth character of onyomi in a row, I'm just like, I don't even know. Yeah, it's like starts to sound like Chinese at a certain point. And then I would screw that up. And because I was playing the Nine Haruto, the like kind of like main guy who's supposed to be intimidating, I couldn't do like broken Japanese. <laughs> Not broken Japanese, but like in like if a Japanese person listened to it, they wouldn't want it to be like that sounds yeah. a little bit off. So that was a huge struggle for me. And it has not been a struggle for me even anywhere near that this in this most recent stage play. So that was my original point was that compared to 10 yeah, years ago, I yeah. know that I know like objectively that my Japanese is definitely much, um, I guess like sturdier. Like I'm not, yeah. I'm not so, um, I'm not trying so hard to be correct all the time anymore. Um, yeah, yeah. so it's easier. So it's definitely much better, but it was not like I was not, struggling in Japanese I just was definitely not as refined as it might be now yeah yeah that makes sense 
And now that you brought up pitch accent, so when you were doing that play and you were, I'm assuming there's other people who were correcting your pitch accent because to help you get it right. So to what extent did you have conscious knowledge of how pitch accent works? Like, were you still just totally on the level of in- intuition and you can hear when they repeat it back to you with the correct pronunciation, you can just hear it and mimic it? Or did you study the patterns at all? I was really fortunate. Um, my host mother in Tokyo was just a sickler for pitch accent when I first went to Japan when I was 15. And I knew what pitch accent was um, from my teacher in in high school. Um, and I guess maybe I had never really sat down and been like, okay, this is like the theory, this is the way that it goes. But I had, I, not quite intuitively, but not specifically working really hard at it but my host mother would we'd be in the middle of some like deep conversation about whatever and she'd be like wait a minute (laughs) that something's jacked up about (laughs) whatever what you're saying (laughs) and so I knew what pitch accent was but I didn't realize I guess how many mistakes I was making because she would point it out to me so frequently that I and at the time I'd be like well those are all the pitch accent mistakes so if I'm doing pretty well if I'm only making like a, a few <laughs> mistakes per conversation yeah, she, 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 you thought she was telling you literally every mistake yeah you made. but no she was telling the ones that were so not so Agreed, but just... were incorrect to the point that you know a Japanese person might be like wait what because there's mm-hmm. quite a few words in Japanese that are I guess what's the word homonyms yeah, like minimal pairs, where the pitch accent's the only difference between two different words, like rain and candy. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So those ones she would correct. But I think my problem that I always had was I would, like, raise my tenyoha, the, like, particles. Mm-hmm. Because the the habit that I had formed was because at the particle, I would be thinking about what I wanted to say. I would be like, nani nani wa, <laughs> when it's supposed to say nani nani wa. So, mm-hmm. But I would raise it just thinking, no, I'm not raising it because I'm not raising it because it's supposed to be raised. I'm raising it because I'm just thinking. But that's not. Yeah, that's not how it works. So <laughs> I don't think she was correcting those ones as much where it was not. I see. Like, but I the other problem that I still sometimes have is when I'm reading out loud, I tend to make pitch accent mistakes because no matter how hard I study Japanese, I'm not reading like, I mean, I just, I didn't grow up in Japan or, like, go to school in Japanese. So the amount of times that I've spent, like, with a paper in front of me and, like, reading out loud is just not, you know, at the level of a native Japanese speaker. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not <laughs> prepared to do all the work it would take to get it there at this point. <laughs> but um, I think that, so when I was doing that play, the big thing that was, was a struggle for me was I would read the lines in my mind Mm -hmm. and because I when I read things they would stray away from the way I would say them if I wasn't thinking about it it would get even more messed up because Mm. I was thinking so hard about which is correct and so everything that I had been doing intuitively that was keeping me from making really really off mistakes would kind of like work against me when I was I was like wait which which is it so that was um, a journey, but, and I still make plenty of pitch accent mistakes, but um, not nearly as many as I did at that time. Yeah, yeah. So what was the process of ironing out whatever kind of odd habits that you'd picked up up until that point when you were doing the play? Um, well, I think when you, when you notice pitch accent, after you notice pitch accent, I think it's really up. I mean, maybe even, how do you, I guess it's really, I don't want to say downhill, that's not what I mean to say. That's the hardest part, is noticing it. Yeah. So once you notice it, you're going to always notice it. Because even when I still, when I speak, when I'm just speaking, sometimes I don't notice it when I say it. But if I listen to, like, my radio program, I do like an hour a week. If I listen to my radio program back, every once in a while I'll be like, wait, I don't remember 
saying that so completely incorrectly at the time, but it definitely is something that you hear. And when you're thinking about talking, you might not notice it, even if you do make a mistake. So mm -hmm. my process has just been to listen, obviously to myself speaking, but also to other other Japanese people, <laughs> other, other people, listen to other people. And when I, sometimes I'll hear something that I'll be like, I did not know, especially with names, because there's a lot of times where every once in a while you're, you'll come across a name that seems like it doesn't fit everything else that you think should be correct. And those are the ones that now that it's been 10 years, I mean, obviously I should say all this, I should uh, mention that I've been in Japan for 10 years, so it's not like I haven't like put in the day-to-day -day time of just speaking Japanese. Yeah. But as far as like the conscious effort, it's definitely just keeping an ear out and making sure that when it, if you listen back to yourself speaking, that you at least can recognize where you make a mistake. Because once you recognize it, especially in my case, because I make the mistake on the radio or on TV where everybody sees it and everybody is like, that is a mistake. <laughs> and so I get to be really embarrassed about it every single time that it happens. So that ends up um, kind of making it easier for me to remember because every yeah. mistake comes with like a big let down to myself of <laughs> putting my mistake out there for everybody to hear. But yeah. Intense emotions always create strong memories. So for I sure. That. Makes sense. Yeah. And so for these 10 years that you've been in Japan, so we kind of talked about the pitch accent. That was a point where you definitely maybe became at least a little more conscious about improving your Japanese. Outside of that, in general, was it mostly just you were living your entire life in Japanese and you had opportunities to kind of listen back to yourself. So you naturally got better and better. Or were you still like, no, I want to take my Japanese to the next level and I'm going to put conscious work into that um for me it was I guess for better or worse definitely the former I didn't I haven't I guess f really sat down and studied Japanese other than if I needed something like technical for my work because I didn't go to school in Japan a lot of my big probably like places where I'm lacking would be mm -hmm. specific subjects like I mean, I guess probably also in English, but math or science or things like that, mm -hmm. where you wouldn't use them in daily, you wouldn't use the words in daily conversation. Um, every once in a while when I'm doing the radio program and the today's topic is like, you know, some sort of like diet trend that has a bunch of like uh, scientific, vocabulary. scientific vocabulary kind of things, um, I'll be like, I don't know what that is and then I'll google it and I don't know what it is in English either so I don't know if that's really <laughs> has a lot to do with Japanese <laughs> but um so I think that my thing has always been um I guess when you live in Japan and you get to a level where you're speaking to Japanese people and Japanese people stop kind of um I'm trying to think of like the appropriate way to say this like stop Tr not, I mean, they'll always treat you like a foreign person, but stop kind of like um, excusing or I guess holding back because of your Japanese. Uh -huh. So Japanese people will eventually, of course, if you're speaking Japanese at a level where they feel like they can say everything that they want to without having to wonder if you're going to understand them. Uh -huh. When you get to that level, it kind of becomes... Like, you want to make sure that you're um, able to, I don't want to say face off, because obviously it's not a battle, but, like, you can face off with a Japanese person in a conversation. Yeah. Because the reality is, if you're spending 10 years in Japan, and you're working in Japan, and your friends are Japanese, and yada, 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 there's... A, you don't want to spend your whole life having people, knowing that people are holding back because yeah, they're worried totally. that you might not understand or you might not get a joke or you might not get this or you might not get this reference or that reference. Um, that's not, you know, the 
the, I mean, the best feeling. So I guess since I've been in Japan for so long, the reason that my Japanese has probably improved even though I'm not sitting down and studying is because I guess I have that, I, I live in Japan and I know that my life is here. So I wanna make sure that I'm not having like m miss out on anything, I guess, just because I started at a completely different place than everybody around me. Um, so I do think about that a lot is, but for me, that wasn't necessarily just Japanese as a language, but definitely, definitely specifically references, specifically like the quality of your voice and pitch accent. Um, because Japanese people will notice, and I mean, immediately for better or worse, if Japanese sounds off. And that's not necessarily, you know, everybody doesn't have to have perfect Japanese. And that doesn't mean that Japanese people are going to judge you. But it, it does mean that, you know, that they're, that many Japanese people might, you know, feel the need to, like, every other sentence be like, oh, do you know what that meant? <laughs> yeah. And that's, A, embarrassing, and B, more than anything, annoying. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it's something that definitely I worked to improve my Japanese so that I could enjoy myself fully yeah. was the big thing for me. So I don't think it was so much an academic thing so much as it was just a yeah. a, a personal thing, knowing that yeah. I've invested so much of my life into being in Japan. I think that totally makes sense because what, what I've seen and what my experience has been is that when you're contacting the Japanese language, the kind of mindset you bring to it, what well, maybe they'd say kokorokamae in Japanese, affects the way that your brain responds to it. If you're coming at it with that perspective you kind of just described of, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything, I want to make sure I can really hold my own, then you you learn more, you take more away from it, just naturally. Like you're, it feeds your intuition more than if you kind of have this mindset of like, oh, I already beat the game, so it's whatever, you know? And I think that's why a lot of people can live in Japan and they kind of reach a point and maybe stop to stop improving, even if they're completely immersed in the language, is because some part of their mind has become satisfied and has stopped worrying about um, what you just described, basically. Definitely. I think some people are... Um, I think I've always, even before Japanese and even living in America and speaking English, I've just liked... I've always been someone who enjoyed communicating. So I think that if I had to feel like the communication was being affected by my ability yeah. to, to communicate, then it would just make me, a, of course, feel uncomfortable. And, you know, that that's, I mean, that's not the way that I want to be viewed and not the way that I want to, you know, live in society. So I think that just always knowing that I, or not always knowing, but always wanting to improve is probably the m most important <laughs> factor in improving. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. That's where it all starts. Yeah, so then I guess on the other side of things, so you've, it seems like you've largely lived your, most of your adult life, the last 10 years, entirely in Japanese. So how often do you use English on a daily basis? Do you feel like your English ability has suffered because of, of your Japanese? People ask me that a lot, and my well, Japanese people ask me that a lot because that's, I guess, interesting, specifically interesting to people who probably, like, haven't spoken a second language, especially for an extremely extended period of time. Um, of course, like, my English doesn't get, I don't stop understanding English, but definitely, and I felt it in this interview too, I just, I say like and um a lot. <laughs> and I think... Not necessarily that I'm, what I'm thinking comes out in Japanese first so much as my, just physically, my mouth is not used to speaking English. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I speak English probably, I mean, not even 1% of the time. <laughs> Only usually when I call my parents, which they will tell you is not nearly enough. <laughs> so... Uh, probably, like, I have an extended conversation in English, like, once a month, maybe. Um, I don't work with anybody who speaks English natively. And I think that in the position that I'm in right now, um, 
if the other person doesn't speak English natively, then Japanese people don't want to speak English with me because I speak Japanese. So yeah. I don't really have, an, I love speaking English now because I never get an opportunity to, but <laughs> almost not obviously in the, in the same way, but in a slightly different way, almost the way that I loved speaking Japanese when I first came to Japan. I still love speaking Japanese, but I don't really think about speaking Japanese anymore. So that was a big uh, difference. But I do, I, I mean, probably not even an exaggeration, probably 1% or less of the time <laughs> I'm speaking. Wow. Yeah, English. well, I mean. Hearing that, I, I think your English is really great. Really, like, I mean, it's so weird to say fluent, but I mean, Considering that you almost never speak English, you seem super comfortable, like, speaking about... I do... Sophisticated topics and stuff. ...watch more American, or I guess English media now that I'm in Japan. Well, I guess at the time, I was immersing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, that was the only reason I wasn't watching American media. But I do, like, listen to English plenty. And, of course, like, okay. I watch YouTube in English. Um, I watch YouTube in Japanese as well, but... I do like input English plenty. So the only problem that I run into is I find that when I speak English for extended periods of time to my family too, and it only happened a couple times today, but I, I forget what I was saying in the middle of it when I think of when a Japanese word pops into my head or something that I yeah. want to say in Japanese. And that's when I get annoyed speaking English is because I, it, I, it destroys my train of thought, but... um. But other than that, I don't think that I don't think that you you really get bad at your native language so much as you just get maybe a little rusty. But, yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. The one thing that I know for sure that Japanese has affected my English is not so much not being able to speak English so much as that I say things that I wouldn't have said if I was mm. um, in or if I had been in America. And that's just because of all of the, I don't want to say meaningless because they do mean something, but there's a lot of words in Japanese that don't have like a specific meaning so much as just it's important to say them. And so oh, I yeah. feel the need like, to for like, example? like, Otsukare sama desu or like, Ohayo wa I see, yeah. Like just, a kind of I, aisatsu. And just different, like, um, even just phrases. So it'll be something like, yokatara onegaishimasu or like, so if you don't mind, and in English, if you're qualifying everything and being like, oh, if it's not a bother or this or that, it's almost like, it's not even that uh, polite. It's not even specifically like that yeah. polite. It's just somebody who really, really, really doesn't <laughs> want to give anybody any reason to be mad at them. But um, I think I have a really bad habit of like, qualifying everything that I say, um, possibly also because of the kind of work that I do. I don't want to get canceled, but <laughs> I think, you know, those kind of, um, being too indirect, I guess, is something that yeah. definitely Japanese, Japanese, at the very least, Japanese lifestyle has affected my English in that way. I always say sorry for things and my parents are like, what, yeah. did, what did you do? <laughs> yeah, I do that too. It's like, instead of just saying thank you, you like apologize for making someone go out of their way to do something. Definitely. Yeah. I don't mean to like, I don't mean, that, like if my mom, I this is an example that I used on my YouTube the other day, but like my mom would start the car for me in the morning because it's cold and just like mm -hmm. turn the heater on and she'd come over and I started the car and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. And my mom was like, <laughs> you're sorry for what? <laughs> I didn't even, you didn't even ask me to. So those, that's like a habit that I definitely form. Um, and it takes, it's like impossible to break out of unless I'm really, really ex for an extended period of time in the States. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And I think you have some other videos on your channel where you kind of explore how Japan has changed you or Japanese has changed you. And so anyone studying Japanese, can definitely go check that out to uh, hear inter interesting uh, ideas and get a practice Japanese. But yeah, so I guess going forward like looking forward to the future so you've spent so far kind of seems like your whole adult life in japan but you're still pretty young do you think you're probably going to spend the rest of your life in japan um i think i definitely will always have my base well i don't know i don't want to say always because i don't i'm not a fortune teller but i 
I definitely imagine that I would have my base in Japan, but I do think that I have a desire now probably to spend more time A, in the States, and B, specifically with my family. Just because, mm. you know, when you're 18 or 17 or whatever, your parents are only like four in their 40s. So, or mine <laughs> were only in their 40s. Mm -hmm. So I was like, they're going to live forever. <laughs> and now with like the pandemic and everything, um, it, it kind of, I was... I, it reminded me that I can't like there's there is like an end to everything yeah and I want to make sure that I'm not um because I love I still can say confidently after 10 years here that I love living in Japan and I mean that it's a combination of I guess whether intentional or not like work that I put in and also I think just kind of like my personality as it was just happened to be a at least decent fit with Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I really enjoy my life here and I can't imagine, like, I don't even, I don't know how to do anything in the States. I don't know how to like pay my rent <laughs> or, <laughs> or any of that. I imagine it's probably mostly the same, but um, I don't know how to like wire money <laughs> or do yeah, that's like interesting. any adult things in the States. Um, I don't know how to, I guess, like what is expected of me in an American workplace or things like that. Um, so I think that I'd like to spend more time in the States, but I think that I'll, at least for the foreseeable future, will stay in the Tokyo area. Yeah, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. That's cool. So yeah, I guess to kind of bring it to a close, uh, what advice would you have for people who are interested in potentially taking a similar path as you, where they're really interested in Japan and maybe they're interested in doing Gainu Katsudo or something like that. Uh, well, first of all, would you recommend it? And if you would, uh, what things would you recommend that they do? Well, I could definitely say if you want to do it, then I would definitely recommend it. Um, I think that my best advice would just be if you... W I've always said this to Japanese people who tell me that they wish they could speak English. Is I always say that if you want to speak a language you will but <laughs> i mean if you, if you just wish you spoke a language then you're not gonna <laughs> speak a language so if you want to do something i would always say it's probably better to do it and then figure out what to do when things don't go the way you thought they might um than to not do it and wonder how things could have gone mm -hmm. um I guess that's probably not specifically just with language yeah, or living yeah. in Japan. But um, I think that it's definitely, if you are interested in Japan and you want to um, experience that, I mean, for the, most people, at least I, I was privileged enough that, you know, even if everything went wrong, I can just go home. <laughs> so, I mean, worst case scenario is probably not as bad as you're worried that it might be. So I would say definitely um, shoot for the... S s s wait, which is it? Which one do you shoot for? Wait, where do you land? Uh, shoot Actually, for the I'm moon? Just about this. <laughs> shoot for, I was going to say shoot for the moon and land among the stars, but the moon is so much closer than the stars. It's quite an interesting phrase. Um, but definitely, you know, go for it. And, you know, there you can always... It will not be time wasted is one thing that I can definitely say. So at the very least, it'll be an experience that I think would enrich your life, even if you were to go back to where you grew up. Um, I'd say as far as like actually doing it, the specific advice I would have um, is in regards to Japan specifically, y you will have a completely different experience in Japan based on your Japanese level, for better or worse. So... You know, if you don't speak Japanese at all, you can still come to Japan and have fun and you can still come to Japan and in a lot of cases lead a perfectly fulfilling life. But, you know, if you want to come to Japan um, and specifically do some sort of field of like work, like gain no katsudo, then I would very, very strongly recommend being able to speak Japanese to a level where A, you can really 
enjoy what you're doing and b people won't take advantage of you <laughs> so um i think that it's probably not as scary as it might seem and um if it's something that you want to do then do now and think later awesome yeah that uh means a lot coming coming from you though <laughs> It yeah, sometimes works again. out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, I think we got to cover a lot of ground and I learned a lot. Really enjoyed talking to you. So thanks again so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, hopefully we can talk again sometime. For sure, for sure. Later, guys. Hey, guys, hope you enjoyed that interview. I know I had a really good time filming it. It was great to get to talk to Nick. And before closing, I just wanted to remind everybody to please click that first link in the description and give me some advice on what type of content I should make for you guys in these next coming weeks. It's not going to take very long, it should take you guys less than five minutes, and I'm going to be reading each and every response personally. So I'd really appreciate it if you guys could help me out and give me some advice. So that's all for me, and I'll see you guys in the next one.